Good morning and welcome to COVID-19 360. It is Tuesday and we're back with some more information on the pandemic and more all across the globe. Now the heavy downpour has plunged the country or parts of it into chaos. Uh, people are losing their livelihoods as a result. Their homes are being washed away or flooded completely. And this is affecting the ability to socially distance as well. Because if your room is flooded and you have to end up sharing a room with someone, how do you then socially distance, especially if there are a number of you in that room as well. It's it's really sad and we'll be talking about that and a lot more today but quickly also uh, as part of our COVID-19 news update we'll be talking about Tanzania and the fact that their president has declared the country COVID-19 free. Now they have not updated their website since April 29th and on that day they had about 509 cases with 21 deaths. Now he says that they are free as a result of prayers and so people should go to the churches and the mosque and continue to pray because it will really each country of coronavirus. You'll get more of that information on the news updates, but tell us what you think about it. Anyway, my name is Bella Mundi. And my name is Anita Ekia Ekufu. But down here in Ghana, it's been 90 days of COVID-19 and our figure stands at 9,910. That means we're 90 cases away from that 10,000 mark. And also we have had some nine new recoveries. So we've given you all those updates. But you can get in touch with us via our social media pages as well. And how are you keeping up, especially in these times and also the flats as well? We will be giving you all the figures and all the updates when it comes to the situation right here in Ghana, Bella? Absolutely. Now, with nine new recoveries, we've also recorded four new deaths. And out of those four, uh, which were all recorded in the Ashanti region, there's one man, age 21, um, who had no underlying health condition and still lost his life. And so it begs the question, um, is it only people with comorbidities that could lose their lives as a result of COVID-19 or anybody at all can lose their lives? We'll ask Dr. Bertha what she makes of this particular um, person who lost his life as a result of COVID-19 with no comorbidity. It's, it beats my mind, honestly, because I it feel really like you're more susceptible when you have other underlying illnesses. But if you were fine, it, <sighs> I don't get it. But it just also reminds us to continue remaining safe, try as much as possible to stay away as far as possible uh, from each other and continue to wash your hands with soap and running water. Also use your sanitizers and also try to wear your nose mask as much as possible, especially at a point where you cannot socially distance yourself from other people. But uh, Anita mentioned that our numbers have increased and so we'll take a look at that and we'll give you the news updates. And so we've recorded 272 new figures and that has pushed our figure to 9,910 confirmed coronavirus cases right here in Ghana. And like I mentioned earlier, we're just 90 cases away from that 10,000 mark, that dreaded mark that we all thought that uh, it wouldn't happen, looking at how we started off and how we were trying to contain the virus. But we are very closer and we're inching closer to that. We have nine new recoveries. Our recoveries is at 3,645 and then four new deaths all from the Ashanti region moving our death toll from 44 to 48 and now when we look at the active cases we have 6217 active cases right here in Ghana and uh, when it comes to the region by region that is from highest to lowest greater Accra region is still the epicenter with 6,436, Ashanti region with 1,734, Western region 769, and still the Ahafu region is the only region in Ghana without any case. And interestingly, when you come to the gender distribution, initially it was more of the males having the virus than the females, but the gap is gradually closing. As you can see, the males are now 58% and females at 42%. Initially, it was 60 against 40. And so we can say that more females are also being, um, you know, infected with the virus. So the females at 42, males at 58. And this in totality is how our figure or our case count is looking right here in Ghana. And also our positivity rate 
is now at 4.21%. Uh, later on, I'll be giving you more updates on the African continent, certain countries that brought in health experts from China and how they are faring and also how their cases have, you know, increased over time in just uh, a spate of four weeks. And so we are giving you all those details and also globally, we've hit the 7 million mark all right here on COVID-19 360. We'll be giving you the details, Bella. All right. So there's a doctor who has put out some advice and I'll just read parts of it. Uh, it's also something that will um, have Dr. Bertha respond to. But quickly, it says that a South Korean church was an epicenter of the pandemic and linked to over 7,000 cases of COVID. A single three hour choir practice in a church left three people dead. A church service for 92 people ended with a death of five. And so pastors and priests of all denominations have been dying and parishioners have been catching the virus as well. Fast forward says there's something in medicine we call informed consent, meaning you get to make the final decision. And the only role of a physician is to accurately and in integrity tell you the health pros and cons of the decision based on evidence based medicine. Again, fast forward says that, so if any patient over 50 came into my office, my medical advice would be to absolutely not go to church for the next few months. And if anyone has medical conditions, they should not go either, especially if they are black and Hispanic. Too many people of color are disproportionately dying of COVID, and this is absolutely heartbreaking. And this is an advice from a medical doctor to anybody who may have missed church um, and might want to go, but is above 50 or might have any underlying ailments as well. Stay away from church. We'll have Dr. Bertha touch on it a bit to give more details as to why it's important as well, even though we know that um, the aged and people who also have underlying ailments are more susceptible. But now it's time for news updates. And so we'll take a look at that. It's COVID-19 360. We have a lot more coming up. Okay, you know what, we'll hold on and just take a look at uh, the numbers for Africa before we move on to news. Okay, so as at yesterday, I figure on the African continent was hovering around 190,000. And this morning, more cases have been recorded on the continent, giving us a total of 197,020 confirmed coronavirus cases in Africa. And South Africa has taken the lead with over 50,000 cases. That is 50,879. And South Africa is the first country on the African continent to cross that 50,000 mark. And they have done over 1 million tests so far. And looking at this figure... Hmm. But moving on swiftly, Egypt comes in second with 35,444 and Nigeria has 12,801. And earlier I mentioned that some countries in Africa brought in some Chinese uh, medical doctors to help them contain the virus. And Nigeria is one of those countries. And Algeria, which is now fourth, is another country that brought in some experts from uh, China somewhere mid-May. And these two countries, looking at few weeks back and now they've been able to rack up over 5,000 cases just within those few weeks. And so the question on the minds of many people is that uh, was the, you know, initiative of bringing in the medical doctors anything uh, worth, you know, taking? And so that is the question on the minds of many people. But Algeria now has 10,265 confirmed coronavirus cases and then Ghana comes in fifth with 9,910, just 90 cases away from that 10,000 mark. And Morocco has 8,408 confirmed cases. Cameroon with 8,312. Now let's look at the recoveries, which most of the time are more interested in because it gives us uh, some form of hope that even though we're recording cases, the recoveries are also quite impressive on the African continent. And as of this morning, uh, our recoveries on the continent is at 86,571 with South Africa leading with 26,099. And when it comes to the recoveries in South Africa, the Western Cape, which is also contributing to over 68% of the cases in South Africa, South Africa is contributing to most of the recoveries as well. So when we move to Egypt, Egypt also has 9,375 recoveries. There's a vast difference when it comes to South Africa and the other countries on the African continent continent in terms of cases, recoveries, and it's just deaths that South Africa is not on that list as well. And Morocco has 7,423 recoveries, Algeria with 6,799, Cameroon with 4,794, giving them the fifth position, and then Nigeria with 4,040. Now let's look at 
the deaths on the continent as well. And Egypt is leading the pack with 1,271 confirmed coronavirus deaths in Egypt. And in South Africa, 1,080 deaths. Algeria, 715. Sudan, 372. Nigeria, 361. Morocco has 208. Cameroon has 208. Mali has 92. And you realize when it comes to the deaths, as you go down, it keeps reducing. And it's quite, you know, okay looking at the deaths on the African continent as compared to the global figure and other countries that are on the global front and the figures they are recording. And let's look at healthcare workers in the various countries on the continent who are recording some deaths when it comes to healthcare workers and also the cases. Now, Nigeria is a leading when it comes to health workers who have been affected by the COVID-19 virus. And it is quite heartbreaking. Initially, South Africa was leading the pack. Now, they have moved to second place with Nigeria leading with 812 and then two deaths. South Africa comes in second with 511 deaths when it comes to healthcare workers and 14 deaths. Egypt, 350 cases, 19 deaths. Cameroon, with 293 and then three deaths. And so Niger, Ghana has uh, 126 cases, no deaths of any health worker. And then Tunisia, Sierra Leone, the list goes on and on. And uh, as of now, the projection on the African continent is over 200,000. So by the end of the week, it looks like we would have crossed that projection and more cases will be recorded because there's more community spread, more infections, you know, on the community level as well. And so it makes it quite... When mm. I go through the charts like this, that it's is when you, you realize how serious this it's is. It's heartbreaking. And Very. I think this morning we spoke to a medical doctor who contracted the virus and uh, he took us through his ordeal. And he's actually scared. To he's suffering to from work. psychological mm -hmm. trauma because he's scared of going back to the same place where he contracted the virus. And so, you know, doctors are not left out. Health workers are not left out because they, on a daily basis, are coming into contact with patients who may have uh, coronavirus as well. And it makes them even more at risk than anyone. So we just hope and pray that they have more PPEs and they're well protected. And we pray that you also continue to protect yourselves. It's COVID-19 um, 360. And so we'll be back with some more news updates. We'll also give you uh, the global figures as well as have conversations with some experts in various fields. Keep watching. We'll be back. Welcome back. It's uh, still COVID-19 360. And that was news updates. Apologies for um, that break in sound. But it's time for the global figures. Anita will give us that information. And so globally, we've gone past the 7 million mark. And this morning, as of the last update, our figure globally is at 7,136,366 confirmed cases globally. And the United States is leading with over 1.9 million cases. And there are fears that amidst the protest uh, in recent times, you know, due to the killing of uh, George Floyd in the uh, United States, uh, there will be a spike in coronavirus cases in the U.S. because uh, during the march and the protest, a lot of people converged to uh, channel their grievances and what they are not happy about. And so that convergence could lead to a spike. And as of this morning, the state contributing to the highest number of cases in the U.S. is Florida. And uh, there are fears that the spike in that particular state will also contribute to the high numbers that the United States is recording. But when you go to Brazil, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, the president of Brazil, is still under, under pressure for non-adherence to most of the protocols and telling people not to adhere to the protocols. And so they are attributing the high numbers, that is over 700,000 confirmed coronavirus cases in Brazil to the attitude of their president. And so Brazil still second on the list with 707,412. When you go to Russia, like we mentioned in the news update, they are easing on restrictions and also they have plans on opening their borders to allow people who are coming into Russia for medical attention and the likes to also attend to uh, other, you know, um, residents who are not well to be able to come in and do all of that. But uh, most of the residents or the citizens are not particularly happy about the opening of the border and then easing on the restrictions. Look at the high number they are still on, high numbers they are still recording. And so on the global chat, the United Kingdom comes in fourth with 200 
and 88,834. India, fifth with 267,249. And recently, there has been another spike of um, cases in India, which is creating some sort of panic as well. Now, let's move over to the recoveries in, uh, you know, from the Johns Hopkins website. And our recoveries now are 3,309,000. 447 recoveries increasing daily and that is quite impressive but the u.s is leading with 518,522 recoveries brazil with 378,257 russia with 241,917 and interestingly you can see that when it comes to the global chat in terms of the cases recorded and the recoveries the chat is following almost the same pattern uh, with the exception of Germany replacing the United Kingdom when it comes to recoveries uh, as compared to the case chart. And so Russia is also third here with 241,917 recoveries. Germany with 170,050 recoveries. And Germany has been touted as one of the countries that has done quite well when it comes to their recoveries and containing the virus as well. Italy has 166,584. Now away from the recoveries, let's take a look at the global debts and barely um, a week or two weeks ago uh, global debts moved uh, over the 300,000 mark and this morning as of the last update on the Johns Hopkins website we have 406 1,913 global debts with the United States contributing a whooping 111,007 debts. The United Kingdom comes in second with 40,680, Brazil 37,134 debts, Italy with 33,964 debts. And so when you go on the Johns Hopkins website, all the updates you need, all the figures are there. And now the projection has moved from 5 million as of uh, barely two weeks ago to 6 million. And now we are at 7 million. And now the projection is at 8 million. And as you can see from that yellow, you know, sharp curve moving up there, it keeps moving up swiftly and very, very fast. And it doesn't look like flattening anytime soon, but we're still hopeful. And so that is the global figure over 7 million cases globally with the United States leading. Interesting, I must say. And uh, well, yes, we'll be speaking to our health experts now. We'll be asking some of these questions um, that we raised at the beginning of the show. And also, um, we'll, we'll talk about the young man who lost his life as a result of COVID-19 with no underlying illness at all. We have Dr. Betha Sewa'ai and Dr. New Manatha. Dr. Betha Sewa'ai, by the way, is an infectious disease specialist. And Dr. New Manatha is also um, a clinical psychologist. I don't know if they can hear me, but hello, doctors. Hello? Okay. Well, some of the questions we'll be asking them is in relation to the fact that um, a number of countries are gradually easing their restrictions. And as a result, we're asking, uh, could this mean that there could be a spike in numbers? And if that's the case, could we see the world going back under lockdown, especially for majority of those countries who were under lockdown for many, many weeks? Um, we'll be asking that question as well as how someone without any underlying condition could also lose his life. Uh, what does that mean for everyone else who may not have any other comorbidity? And so that and more on COVID-19 360 will be right back. Welcome back, still COVID-19 360, and Dr. Betha Sewa Ayi has just joined us. She is an infectious disease specialist. She's given us so much advice, uh, given us so much information, and she's back with some more. Good morning, Doc, and welcome to COVID-19 360. Good morning, Bella, and good morning to your audience as well. Absolutely, and I hope you're well. First of all, so a lot of countries have started easing restrictions, and you'll notice that as much as the advising that we adhere to the social distancing directives. A lot of people have thrown that, um, you know, to the dogs. Nobody really, or just a few people, are washing their hands regularly. You barely even find people carrying sanitizers as much as before and using them religiously. Now there's also the issue of protest. Um, you know, it started in the United States against racism, and now a number of countries are also staging protests against racism. And so a lot of them may not have masks. There are too many people crowded at one point. Do you see a likely spike in global numbers based on some of these protests and the easing of restrictions as well. 
Well, the, first of all, um, thank you for the questions. The countries or the states that have eased restrictions, they did it with reason, apart from a few cases. For example, New York was one of the hardest hit states. And mm -hmm. this Monday, which was yesterday, was the first day they opened. And if you want to see a beautiful epidemiology curve, you look at the curve. At some point, they were having more than 500 people die every day. Mm -hmm. And now they're down to like 30 deaths a day. I mean, that's not to say 30 people dying in one state is anything to brag about. But you could see they had a peak. And they put in a lot of strict measures. And their, their cases are really, really down. And so they are opening scientifically based on reason. Some countries are just opening because, look, life has to go on and they're doing it without abundance. And unfortunately for some of them, you know, the disease gets to a, pay, a stage where you call it like an exponential increase. Now so many people have it that there's so much transmission. So I think that with all the protests, there will come a time when the cases will start to spike. But unfortunately, with this disease, because the incubation period is 14 days, you actually don't get to see the effect of any act action until about two weeks later. So we're going to find out in about two weeks whether there's a spike. Does it mean but that we're gauging wrongly? Well, we're not gauging wrongly. I mean, if you look at it, authorities did what they needed to do. And um, then you had a social event where an African-American gets killed and everybody sees it on um video and um it just seems to be the final straw that breaks the camel's back and so when journalists interview some of those going on protests they say they would rather die of COVID-19 than to watch their children go through the same kind of ill treatments that they saw on the video and and racial issues have been century long and mm -hmm. so people feel you know what this is more important to me than anything else. Um, if I die, let me die. I may die fighting for a good cause that I believe in. But could this not lead the countries um, back under lockdown? Because that's what saved us. I mean, there was a story about how about 3 million people or more were saved as a result of the lockdown. And so there was some good to it. Now that people are out, so many people converging at places to protest and all that. Are we likely to go back under lockdown? Should we start preparing for something like that? Well, I think specifically for Ghana, I don't think we've had any um, major protests going on in Ghana. Oh, we, and we, so we did, we we did have one major one that ended up with the leader uh, being arrested and all of that. Oh, I see. I yeah. mean, if it was a silent protest and they were observing um, social distancing guidelines, I mean, this, this issue, Ghana has lived through it, um, slavery, abduction of kings, um, ill treatment of African Americans and black people all over the world. So I think people are clearly launching something that is core to their human, um, their human dignity. And so if it was a silent protest, I don't think people should be arrested. But social distancing guidelines need to be placed and they need to put on masks. But if you say globally, this was like a, a, a sore thumb that's sticking out of a very smooth um, smooth plan that we were all very, very cautious. Yes, th this, this is clearly going to disrupt all the things, almost if not reverse, a lot of the measures that have been put in place over the last um, three months or so since this pandemic was declared. Hmm. Anyway, let's move away from that now and talk about Ghana's case counts. We're currently at 9,910, and this was an increase even from yesterday. So we've seen between yesterday and today about 272 new cases. Now, we've also recorded four new deaths, and I just want to give you some information on that and the fact that one of the people who died is male, age 21, and he had no comorbidity as against the other people. So one person was 45 years old, had diabetes and hepatitis B, Another 70-year-old had hypertension. Another 63-year-old had renal impairment. And this 21-year-old, um, no comorbidity, the youngest out of the bunch, and this person rather died. I thought the belief was that, you know, it's more of the aged and more of people with underlying health conditions. So how could this have happened? 
Well, so yes, we recognize for anything you do in this life, even drinking water, they will tell you there are risk factors to doing certain things. If you drink certain types of water, you are more likely. So people more likely to get some foodborne illness. So people with diabetes, hypertension, um, kidney failure, and uh, lung disease have an increased risk of acquiring the infection and dying. But it does not mean at all that young people and previously healthy people will not also acquire the infection and potentially die from it. And I know that based on personal experience, I've had several patients who had no comorbidities whatsoever, who had some of the worst COVID-19 outcomes and they died. So I think that's a misconception that needs to change and change immediately. But clearly, those who have those conditions have an increased risk. Now, so far as our cases are concerned, um, you probably are aware by now that the R0 or the basic reproduction number for this virus is three. So that if we were at 1,000, 8,000, or even let's say when we were at 7,000, if all the mitigating factors by the health authorities hadn't been put in place, ideally those 7,000 should have been 21,000. And the 21,000 should have quickly become um, 63,000. And so I'm still very optimistic that unless, of course, we're not testing as many people as we should, but if we're testing accurately and we're kind of crawling to 10,000, I'm still not um, extremely worried or very, very concerned that, oh, we have a lot of human to human transmission going on. Because if we do, we should be in the 50,000s and 20,000s by now. So I'm still I'm hopeful, especially since a lot of the cases we have are asymptomatic or at least they have really mild illness. I mean, mm -hmm. the kind of um, over flooding of the hospitals we were expecting definitely hasn't happened. I've not heard one treatment center say we're turning away people because we're so full. Yeah. I mean, yesterday it was uh, mentioned that about 90% of our case count are asymptomatic. And so th that could also uh, pose a challenge for a lot of people because, like you said, um, if now we're almost inching close to 10,000, that's what times five. So on the ground, yes. we should be expecting about 50,000 infections across the country. Exactly. Hmm. Interesting. But there was also a doctor who gave an advice because churches have partially been opened or, well, they have been opened, uh, less people in the churches and all that. But she's also saying that if you're 50 years and above and if you have any underlying illness, you should try to stay away. But the Tanzanian president also has declared his country coronavirus free and he said it was all based on prayers, mostly. They prayed to God and so he's advising people to go to church. And so this is a bit conflicting for me because we're saying older people should stay at home. If you have an illness, stay at home. But these are people who might want to also go praise God. Well, I think that you, the, the, you have to cut your quotes according to your size. If you look at New Zealand, for example, New Zealand is almost like an island by itself. They mm -hmm. put in quick, quick measures. And for two weeks, they haven't had any cases whatsoever. So they've declared New Zealand coronavirus free, and now there's no social distancing. Yeah. Life is too normal, but I'm sure they're not letting anybody into the country as well. Mm -hmm. So you can't look at maybe New Zealand's example and follow it when you are, you are hitting close to 10,000. Now, the, the, the article that the doctor wrote is very, very simple. He's, he called it informed consent, I believe. And yeah. even if you do surgery, like you're going to have your appendix removed or your breast removed, the doctors have a right or they, they are supposed to tell you that, you know what, madam, as you go into the operating room, these are your risks. Number one, you could die. Number two, you could get a, an embolus into your lungs. You could get a surgical side. And these are all the side effects and that you are aware of the problems and that you are consenting that you feel that at this point, the benefit of your surgery outweighs the risks. And even if they don't, you are fully aware, but you like to have surgery, it's called informed consent. So the article the, the physician wrote was very simple, that look, anybody who wants to go to church, it's like you are signing an informed consent. You are aware that as you go there, we know that there have been outbreaks at church. We know pastors have died. We know people have been infected. So go to church with a full informed consent that you are aware 
and that you still want to go. And I know both the CDC guidelines in the U.S. and even our Ghana guidelines specifically stated that those who have diabetes, hypertension, and breathing problems should not be going to church. Now, if you take a country like Ghana, so many people have hypertension, undiagnosed. We have so many strokes every day in Kolebu um, neuro units because so many people come in with strokes. They didn't even know they had high blood pressure. So I think it's going to be up to individuals to ask themselves, do I have high blood pressure? Do I have diabetes? Am I in the high risk class? Should I really be going to church? And as people start asking themselves these questions, they then sign an informed consent, an unseen informed consent that, look, I'm aware of these risks and I still want to go. I mean, here in the U.S., there were people when they're in the midst of the outbreak, they said they don't see, they don't think there's any coronavirus and they, they, they still, they, they, they believe they can survive. In fact, one pastor said, you know what, my God has power over the coronavirus. And he was one of the people who died from coronavirus mm. because, so I think there's a place for believing God. And there's also a place for using wisdom um, in taking some of these decisions. All right. So what place do we also give to people who have been uh, displaced as a result of floods? It rained heavily this dawn and some parts of the country uh, are flooded. People have lost their homes. Their homes are flooded completely. They have to find a way to survive. And so, again, with the issue of social distancing, because if I've lost my home and I have to go and perch somewhere else, then how do I socially distance in a home that's already filled with people and all of that? I know. Uh, all I can say is God have mercy. It's like adding um, insults to injury. I mm. mean, the floods are terrible. I see, you know, all these traders with their things. Yeah. Um, this is, and it's, it's very difficult. So I believe this is where our social services should come in and all organizations that help people in distress. Um, we all need to find a way of intervening immediately so people can have a good place to sleep and... Um, some way to restore their funds. And these are the people that, you know, were giving out loans to small businesses and those who deserve it. Um, I think these are the people who should be given priority because clearly they've lost their goods, they've lost um, their belongings yeah. in a very difficult, financially difficult time already. So 2020 has been a trying year, if mm -hmm. you ask me. It has been. And I want you to give some advice to um, uh, leaders, especially because political um, activity is gradually creeping back into the system, uh, starting with the NPP parliamentary primaries. That should happen sometime this month as well. Um, I, I don't know if you can hear me, but I hope that the connection comes back. But what I wanted to ask Dr. Sabetha was what advice you'd give to our politicians moving forward, because there'll be a lot of interaction um, ahead of the primaries and ahead of the elections uh, later this year as well. So um, how do we ensure... Okay, Dr. Betha is back. I don't know if you heard me, but I was talking about political activity uh, gradually coming back. And so what I wanted to find out from you is if you have any advice at all for our politicians, especially because there'll be a lot of interactions with people um, trying to convince them to vote. Uh, there'll be a number of people gathered at, at a place trying to cast their votes and all of that. What really do you think should be put in place to ensure the safety of people? I think that this is a great opportunity because, you know, when Barack Obama won the election um, several years ago, I believe in 2004, well, it, about 2008 or so, one of the strategies that they were known to have used was just information technology. They had a, an army of people sending emails, sending things into people's inbox, raising funds electronically, and that is how they won. And so I think that this social distancing provides an amazing opportunity for all political leaders that now that everybody is looking at their phones, how can we reach out to people that way instead of engaging large crowds who uh, may or may not vote depending on their age and then place them at risk of COVID-19. So my singular, at least one of the best things I can tell them is that leverage electronics and reach out to people, even in terms of telling people to get out and go and vote. This is an amazing time to be able to do that. And they need to be aware that um, they are also placing them at themselves at risk the more they go out and interact with people. 
So they should minimize that and then leverage electronics to make things happen for them. All right. Dr. Betha, thank you so much for spending time with us this morning. And we wish you the very best the rest of the day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay, you're welcome. And pleasure. Right. Thank you for you're welcome. Dr. Bertha Sewa Ayi is an infectious disease specialist. We still have some 30 minutes to go and we'll have a conversation also about the floods and how that is affecting lives across the country. Keep watching. It's COVID-19 360. Welcome back to COVID-19 360. Now let's talk about COVID-19 and road safety. Um, do they have any relationship at all? Uh, we'll be speaking to Daniel Waku. He is the Deputy Director for Planning and Programs at the NSRA. And so good morning and you're welcome good morning. to COVID-19 360. First of all, I want to find out if COVID-19 in any way has affected road safety and whether this has been a positive um, effect it's had on it or not. Thank you very much, Doc. We all know that COVID-19 has affected almost every aspect of our lives, uh, including with safety as well. There is economic and social... Mm. No, it's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, economic and social um, effects that yeah. it has on, on, on us. Uh, when it comes to road safety, we have noticed that um, during the lockdown and the way uh, the system has kind of stabilized or come to ground zero almost, uh, there have been less interactions between people. There have been less travels, um, less vehicles on the road. So mm -hmm. we have noticed that crashes have also gone down okay. during the lockdown and beyond. Um, however, we have also observed that um, after the partial uh, lift yeah. uh, the, of the lockdown, yeah, the crashes have started coming up. Hmm. And that's because we have more people on the road. More roads. people on the road, more vehicles on the road, and the usual human behavior uh, problems that we are having on the road. Do you have any statistics to show, especially comparing to the uh, same period last year and now? Um, we have statistics. Um, for example, in March, we lost about 202 people across in the In March 2020? March 2020. Okay, 202 Two. people. Yeah. And this same time last year? I'm coming. All right. Now, in April, it dropped to about 143. Mm -hmm. Now, in May, it has gone up to 171. Mm. So you realize that it's going up? Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, so far, from January to May, mm -hmm. we have lost 909 people. 909 people? Yeah. Okay. Through road traffic crashes. Hmm. Okay, yeah. but you... Compared to last year, it was 1,063. 1,063? Yeah. Okay, so clearly it has reduced, like you it, mentioned. It, ha it has reduced. So uh, I would say uh, due to the COVID-19 and the slowing down of the economy, mm. less travels, less interactions, less conflicts, we have, uh, we have, we, we have realized that there is a... Uh, uh, a reduction. A reduction. Yeah. But the problem is, is going up. Uh -huh. That's where we have to what, be more concerned about. How can we maintain this? Now, we, we expected that maybe the COVID-19 has come to uh, slow everybody down. Mm -hmm. Let everybody do a, 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 a reflection mm -hmm. on, on, on your life. And I think we did. Oh, yes. A lot yeah. of us did some exactly. introspection. So yeah. we, 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 we want to appeal to people to kind of Continue that kind of self-reflection. Uh, mm. Look at yourself. Now, it is not, I will not say it's the road. Mm -hmm. I will not say it's the vehicle. I will say it is the human beings. The okay, people. so driver behavior. The driver behavior. Mostly okay. the drivers. Mm. They are the ones in charge or in control of the vehicles. Yes. They are the ones in control of the vehicles. If you, the harder you press the accelerator, the harder the impact if something happens. Mm. Who takes that decision? The driver. It's the driver. So it comes back to us. Whether we go reasonably or not, it comes back to us. The National Road Safety Authority, we are doing what we can, what we are mandated to do, we are doing it. Mm -hmm. But the responsibility part of it, or a large part of it, also falls on the individual, the driver, the passenger, the pedestrian, the motor rider. Yeah. All of us have a role to play. The mandated authorities, like the National Road Safety Authority, the DVLA, the mm -hmm. police, 
we will continue to do what we have to do. But on the other side of the coin, the public also has they have their right. Let's have a conversation about you know drivers and whether they're adhering to the social distancing protocols that were put out by the president. Of course, we know that, especially for the commercial vehicles, there's a certain number that they should take. And so they should not go beyond that because of social distancing rules. Um, are they still adhering to that? And are we, based on the easing of restrictions, are we going to see a lift on that as well? Um, the National Safety Authority has been monitoring mm -hmm. the situation on the lorry terminals and on the highways. And to a very large extent, the number of vehicles that, the number of passengers in vehicles, sitting in vehicles, that number or that protocol is being adhered to, to a very large extent. Not, okay. not all the vehicles anyway, but to a very large extent, we will say that drivers are complying quite a lot to okay. this, this protocol. The problem is, at the lorry terminal, mm -hmm. the interaction of the people is difficult to maintain the distance. Mm. That is what the problem is. Okay. At the terminal before they board. Before they board. Exactly. That what? is where we have the challenge. Mm. Did we but, not foresee this challenge when we we're putting out those directives? And what can oh, we no, do? No, no, no. That's for the directive. It came because of the COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, so we will not say because of this, we will, we will define a different parameter for the lorry terminals. Uh, what I would say is, since the wearing of masks is, is a preventive measure, mm. I will encourage everybody to go out with the mask. Yeah. Now, if you are wearing, if you are covered or protected by the mask, then even if the distance is not too much, mm -hmm. you can still you are still more protected than her. Yeah. Let us also. We have also observed that at the lorry stations, uh, averagely, there is this uh, provision of running water where people have been uh, washing their washing hands. Washing their hands, yeah. And then some of the uh, uh, transfer operators also have sanitizers and all that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's quite en encouraging. It's very encouraging. So we just appeal to people to do it more than the way it is. We are Absolutely. Doing it. Yeah. But talking about the number of people per bus or taxi uh, you mentioned that to a large extent the drivers are adhering to it yes. but of course there are a few bad nuts what are we doing about those particular situations um this one uh, as of now we are we are continuing the engagement of the transport operators mm. uh, almost every week we have been having meetings this other me one meeting or the other and we have been uh, appealing to them to try as much as possible because this is a, a national issue a national pandemic mm -hmm. and everybody needs to play their part to be able to contain the disease and since transportation nobody we cannot do without transportation that is a point where we can easily control the disease and that is why we have to appeal to them to be able to ensure the protocols are observed but should there be a penalty because this has been this conversation has been going on for a while about drivers um, you know, limiting the number of passengers in their cars. And so if there's I, still a few... I would say, I would say that this, this is a health issue. Mm -hmm. So if it has to be enforced, it has to be enforced from the health from the okay. health care. Um, the protocols does not really fall under the... Um, Legal. The, the mandate of the National Receipt Court. But okay. we are called upon to support the observance of the protocols mm -hmm. as far as the transportation is concerned. Now, after observing, do you think that it's a good idea to carry on with these protocols even after COVID-19, even though um, we know that it's here I, to stay? I, 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 following the news, I can see that we, we are yet to get out of the red zone. Mm -hmm. So for now, we have to continue. Yeah, if but moving forward, me. even if we should get out of the red zone, is this a protocol that you think we should continue in terms of continuously moving, washing your hands, even at the lorry stations, um, I wearing think, the masks? I think, I think there should be a, a larger forum of stakeholders in the transport industry to sit down and discuss this issue mm -hmm. because some drivers are complaining that because they are taking less passengers they are making less sales mm -hmm. meanwhile they are burning equal amount of fuel or even more because now, uh -huh. now how, do they, how, do they, how do they adjust that okay and now even fuel has maybe even been increased and all that so i am i would suggest that a, a larger forum of transport operators stakeholders of the transport operators be called they sit down and discuss the issue Mm. And then, together, we move forward. But you are also a stakeholder in this yeah, particular... So if you should put out any directives moving forward, what are some of the things that you would stipulate um, you know, for, for this particular sector? Um, we all know in Ghana, for us, we are concerned about deaths 
and serious injuries. We all know in Ghana that speeding is the major cause of accidents in Ghana. So we are concerned about speeding. Mm -hmm. So drivers should ensure that they speed or they drive according to the speed limit of the road that they are, they are, they are driving on. Mm -hmm. We know that in the, in the, in the urban areas it's 50 kilometers per hour. Okay. And areas where we have high population, school zones and hospitals, we have 30 kilometers per hour. Okay. And the highway is 80 kilometers per hour. Motorway is 100 kilometers per hour. We know all this. Drivers, they know this. Mm. We know it. And it is left for us to what? Observe these, these, these rules. Yeah. Now, when we say drivers, a lot of times people think that we are only talking about commercial Commercial, drivers. yes. Private vehicles are very notorious group of road users. They're also very notorious? Very notorious group of road users, private, private drivers. But they would also say that it's a commercial driver. No, no, you know, the statistics show that there are more private vehicles that are involved in crashes than commercial vehicles. Is it? Yes, it is. But just that the private vehicles, they carry less passengers. Mm. That's so why we are not seeing. But, but, okay. but, but the number of crashes that occur that involve private vehicles, they are more than the commercial vehicles. Hmm. That's, that's, that's the truth. That's the reality. That's what the statistics is showing. Okay. Uh -huh. So when we are saying drivers, a lot of times we think that, oh, it's a commercial driver. No, 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 no. Private vehicles equally, private vehicle drivers are equally at all. At I think the reason why they assume that it's a commercial driver is because generally we, we know that the commercial drivers do not adhere as much to some of these um, you know, road regulations. Am I right with that? If they were not adhering, why should the private vehicles be having more crashes than the commercial vehicles? Mm. You see, I'm not saying all the private, uh, commercial vehicle drivers are hot. Of course. Uh, the classic trucks. There are some good ones, a lot of good ones among them. They do the right thing all the time. Mm. But private vehicles. And, and, and we need to hammer on this one. Private car drivers. I mean, they must. They, they also, <laughs> they are Ghanaians. Yeah. They, and we are all using the same roads. We use the same road. The commercial vehicles, they don't use a different road. Yeah. Should authorities be sharing. stricter? On private vehicles because now we know that they are much stricter or more uh, you, you see know. the reason why we focus on the commercial vehicles is because they carry a lot of people at once one bus can carry about 40 people a bus takes about 60. Uh -huh. that's why we focus on that one that's why for example if a, a commercial vehicle gets involved in a crash and a lot of people die at, at, at for example the recent one in january yeah january. Uh -huh. but private vehicles one 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 two 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 and what is but if you add them up there they are contributing to the more than 2,000 deaths we are recording Absolutely. in the country. So they should equally come and play their role. As I said earlier, it's the individual. Mm -hmm. It is you. You have a responsibility to protect yourself and protect the person next to you. Let's be each other's keeper. Mm. It's very, very important. Absolutely. Your misbehavior can lead to someone's death. Mm. But, but you're saying that, you know, when it comes to the legal aspect of the issue, that does not fall on your lap. I'm saying that the legal aspect of the COVID-19 Of the COVID-19. Yes, yes. Okay, but when it comes to, you know, um, putting these drivers in check and also making sure that... The, drive, the, the, the police MTTD have the they, responsibility to enforce the law. But you work hand in hand because you make do. recommendations. We do. We do. Okay. We do. And so moving forward, that's what I'm asking, that for this stakeholder meeting, then we're going to have them oh, also all take of part. Us, all of us are going to be there. Okay. When we talk of the transport sector stakeholders, mm. the assemblies are there, the DVLA, the, yeah. the police are there, the transport to protect themselves are there. And the the media, way. it's also there. Absolutely. Very, very key uh, stakeholder. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, this has been an interesting conversation. I've been speaking to Daniel Waku. He's a deputy director for planning and programs at the National Road Safety Authority. And he gave us some statistics. Um, between March and May 2020, we've recorded 909... No, no, no. Between January and May. Oh, January and May. Okay. Yeah. All right. We've recorded 909 road accidents. Mm -mm. Um, deaths. Deaths from yeah. road the accidents. The number of people that died. Wow. Okay, yeah. so 909 deaths from road accidents between January and May. Same time last year, we had recorded 1,063. And so you'd expect that as a result of less people being on the roads because of the COVID-19 pandemic, you'd have less people dying and less cars crashing. But unfortunately, uh, the difference is just 154. So that means that a lot of work needs to be done. And, and that's why, rising. yes, and it's time. rising as well. Exactly. So a lot of work needs to be done. And drivers, uh, the earnest lies on you as well to also be careful 
on the roads. It's important. Thank you so much, You're Mr. Welcome. Daniel Waku, for joining us. Uh, all right, that's about it for today's edition of COVID-19 360. We're actually hoping for a press briefing, but there was no um, update on that. And so uh, maybe later in the week, we'll be waiting for the information from the Ministry of Information as well. My name is Bella Mundi. I have been doing this with Anita Ekuya Akufu, and we'll be back. Remember, COVID-19 is on every weekday from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Keep watching TV3 and stay safe.